The title of my sermon is Fixated. I felt like a few weeks ago, God just dropped into my head like a, you know, just a word. And I always get a word or a topic and I've always got to then go and discover what it's actually about. And I felt like God was saying, you know, we can get fixated on certain things. You can get fixated on like one event that happened in, a par- in the past and you can't get past it or you can fixate it about one relationship or something like that that, you know, can really stunt the rest of your future because you're looking so much in the past. And I feel like God wants us to fix our eyes on him, not to worry about the things of the past and the things that have happened before, but to fix our eyes on him. The definition of to fixate is to cause someone to develop an obsessive attachment to someone or something. Has anyone had an obsessive attachment to something unhealthy? Justin, put his hand up. I'm sure we've all done it, but there's another definition, and it is to direct one's eyes towards. It's the same thing that I'm saying, that, you know, we can be obsessed with one thing that can ruin our life, or we can turn our eyes and fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such oppositions from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Don't fix your eyes on the past. All those things that entangle you, the snares and the things that will keep you weighed down, but fix your eyes on Jesus so you can move forward and accomplish the race that he has set out for you to do. I'm going to play an ad that I saw on the TV recently, so I'm not promoting this brand, but I just want you to see with your eyes an illustration of what it can be like to be weighed down by everything from the past or all the outward influences when you're meant to be running a race with your eyes on Jesus. So if you can play that, guys. You remember I'm picking Bex up from school, right? The JCI is due Friday, so I'll finish everything I need to do at my end and I'll CC it to you. Which font should we use? Are you going to video chat this weekend? Your dad and I'd love to see the kids. We've forgotten what they look like. Is So God is calling, not sport, but God is calling you to just let that stuff go so you can run. So that word fix your eyes on Jesus, that word means to look away from all else, to fix your gaze. So stop looking at all that other stuff. Just stop looking and fix your eyes on Jesus. You know, when I was about 10, I had an incident that happened at school where a boy through super glue at my eye and it super glued one of my eyes shut together. Now, you would think that's impossible, but trust me, it happened. I have a photo to prove it. This is me as a 10-year-old with my eye super glued together. Um, yeah, someone drew an eyeball on it, so I looked extra special. <laughs> and I had to have a tissue behind it to get all the you know, like when the glue would start to seep and it was really a wonderful time of my life walking around with that on. But what I'm trying to illustrate with that is that something happened in my life that caused my vision to be stuck. I was like a situation caught me off guard and I could not see past it, literally could not see past it. It happened to the eye that I couldn't wink with, you know how you, well I can only wink with one, and it happened to the other one. So I thought I was completely blind. It was very hard for me to see anything. And people would come up to me and say, are you worried that you won't be able to see when, you know, it gets, like, are you worried glue got in your eye? And I was like, I wasn't until you said that. Thank you very much. And then I was very, very concerned about my eyes, whether I would even see again. It was like, 
so impossible to get past that actual event that happened. But I was determined that that event would not, you know, hinder the rest of my life that I would see again. So I was like, I'm getting rid of this. And so we went to the hospital, like when it first happened, and they said, you've got two options. We can slice your eye in the middle and you can have a second slot or you can just put water on it for a few weeks and wait for the glue to dissolve. So I thought, I'll put water on it for two weeks and wait for the glue to dissolve. I don't want two eyelids. Bit strange. So eventually it came unstuck. The glue dissolved, it came unstuck. I could see again, but for the next few weeks, every time I would go to sleep and wake up or any time I'd blink, the remnants of the glue would keep it stuck together and I would have to pull it apart again. And it's like us, you know, we can have gone through an event, you finally get out of the event, but your vision keeps trying to get back to that event that happened. The glue's trying to like make you stay in that negative situation. And you've got to determine, no, I'm going to put the water on the glue and get rid of it completely. And you know, in the Bible, water, river always represents the Holy Spirit. So put two and two together, let God in, the glue will go. So do not get fixated in one spot from one event that will stop you from moving forward. Fix your eyes on Jesus so that you can keep going. Everyone talks about 2020 vision, how it was going to be, you know, like 2020 is going to be such a year of vision and that kind of went downhill. But if you think about it, 2020 has been a year of focus. It's been a year of, you know, taking all that extra stuff away and causing you to really only be with people that, you know, matter. You're, you were kind of stuck with your family. You kind of only had God. You know, you didn't have to do all those extra things. It was actually a good time of focusing back to what the essential things are and getting rid of all the other junk, which is what we really need to do in life, not just in, you know, that, that thing that we got all housebound, but in the spiritual realm as well. We need to focus on what is important and let go of the rest of the junk. Philippians 3.13 says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone and the new is here. And Isaiah 43.18 says, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. You know, every scripture that I found that talks about going forward was preceded by saying, let go of the past. For you to go forward, you've got to let go of the past. You've got to dump all those people that are trying to hang on to you, those past relationships that have still got their claws into you that you're always looking back on or something that you did, a mistake, things like that. You've got to let those things go so that you can move forward and win the prize. Amen? And you might be sitting here saying, I don't have anything. There's nothing I'm even focused on in the, in the past. I'm a free agent. But this is still for you. You still need to fix your eyes on Jesus and fix your eyes on the right thing so you don't get distracted in the future. You know, there's still complications and there's still obstacles that will come up against you in your life. So you need to just stay focused so they don't derail you as well. Adam and Eve had the best thing going, but they fixated on the one thing God told them not to fixate on, right? Genesis 2 verse 8 to 17. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. 
The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So not only did they have the tree that they could eat from and the one that they couldn't eat from, but they also had every other possible tree that was pleasing to the eye and good for food. So they were sorted. It wasn't like, oh, that tree's run out of fruit, so we have to go over here. No, God didn't just give them this one or the other one. There was every possible tree you could think of. And it says there was this river. And this river, you know, you kind of overlook it, but for it to have been explained in such depth, it must be pretty important. It was this river that had a meaning that was to produce all, like to keep, to keep, it was the, you know, to have a garden, you need water, right? This was the water that was going to keep the garden going forever. And these four rivers meant dispersive, so it was going to go everywhere, a bursting forth, it was rapid, and it would break forth and be rushing. So this river was going to be over the whole land. There was not one part of that land that would have been barren, that would have had a dried up tree. It was going to be overflowing, right? Again, the river, the river in the Bible represents the Holy Spirit. They had every single thing possible that they needed that would keep, they were caused to tend that garden and they had the river that would have made it so easy. Everything they needed was in that river that was going to produce this amazing crop. The rest of their life was going to be, you know, fruitful. They had all this amazing thing, but for some reason they wanted one tree that they couldn't have. Like, what was the fixation? Why were they fixated on that one tree? Let's find out. They should have fixated on the tree of life, but someone got in their ear. Genesis 1, 3, 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, You may eat the fruit from the tree in the garden but God did say sorry the woman said to the serpent we may eat from the trees in the garden but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden you must not touch it or if you do you will die you will not certainly die the serpent said to the woman for God knows that when you eat from it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye Keep in mind, the previous scripture just said that there was every tree in the garden that was good for food and pleasing to the eye. And the devil's going, well, this one's good for food and pleasing to the eye. whoop de doo da I've got a whole garden of it. God's given me every single possible thing I could possibly want. And the devil's trying to tempt me with something that I've got 400 million of over here. Bit bizarre. And also desirable for gaining wisdom. That's the key. They wanted to not maybe be under God's control. They wanted their own, like, ability to make their own decisions. Oh, I'm not being told what to do. The Bible says, do this. I'm not doing that, you know. I'm going to make my own decisions. I'll do it my way. See how that goes for you. So she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig trees together and made coverings for themselves. They didn't trust God's advice, did they? And what they got out of it was not this fruitful, enduring life, but they got out of it, it says they were, af- it says they were afraid, they were naked, and they hid. Those words afraid means, oh, sorry, I haven't read that scripture yet, sorry. Genesis 3, 8 says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. They were naked the whole time. They were walking around in freedom. But as soon as they did what they weren't meant to do, it was like they realized they were naked. And that word afraid means to fear. Naked means bareness 
and hid means to withdraw. So the only things that came out of them not focusing on what God told them to focus on and focusing on what they shouldn't focus on was that they were afraid and they withdrew. How many times do we focus on the wrong thing and we think, oh, this will be good, but it actually leaves you afraid of the future, you know, withdrawing, you know, you don't want to see anyone because there's shame, you feel your nakedness because you were dwelling on the wrong thing. But if you dwell on what God's telling you to dwell on himself and looking forward and focusing on him, fixing your eyes on Jesus, not on what's behind, not dwelling on your past, you'll come out with freedom and this fruitful life instead of being ashamed and, you know, secluded and I don't want to see anyone, I don't want anyone to know what I've done, you know, I've done the wrong thing. It all starts from focusing on God and not the past. You know, instead of being like God and having the wisdom of God, they became afraid of God. When God was going to, like, provide absolutely everything that they needed, in the end, they were scared to even talk to him or go to him when he's the one that they needed to get them out of their fear. In Joshua 24, 15, it says, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, Then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. These are those um, immovable things that you can place over your life and over your family and declare that these are the things that our family will be fixated on. We will be fixated on the fact that as a family, we will serve the Lord. I remember a family from church used to have that at their front door. As you'd walk into their house every day, it would say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I've got a little plaque behind a lot of kids' artwork that says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord because that made such a strong conviction in me as a kid seeing someone else's family say, this is an immovable thing. I'm loud and proud to wear it out the front of my house that this is something that we will do. You know, as a family or as a single, as for me, I will serve the Lord. I will go to church. I will pray. I will read my Bible. I will tithe. I will do these things that God's called me to do. Even if I feel like it might not be the right thing for me because I've got a bill over here or I've got something over here, I refuse to fixate on the things that God told me not to worry about. It says that he clothes the lilies of the field and he he looks after all these things. He says, don't worry about your life. Don't, but we can be fixated on our life or fixated on a bill that came or fixated on how am I going to get my visa or all these things that can consume your thinking. And when you're consumed by this thing that you're not meant to be worrying about, all it does is leave you afraid of the future and realize how vulnerable you are and I'm scared and that's what's overflowing out of your life instead of being fixated on the fact that God can provide all my needs. He can, you know, do, you know, why am I worrying about my life when he's already written out the, the steps for my life, when he's already ordained the days and called me to do amazing things? If he's called you to do something, why would you be worried about doing it? Because he will make the way for it. You know, it says, the Bible says that he has put in us everything that we need for godliness and to accomplish what he has called us to do. So why are we worrying about whether we're good enough or whether we've actually got a future or a hope or a purpose because we're not fixed on his word and what he's saying. We're over here fixating on, oh, this person did this to me or someone super glued my eyes together. Can you believe it? I'm going to hate that person for the rest of my life. When really... I can see, you know, there's nothing that, those things don't have to keep you bound if you untangle yourself and drop them like they're hot, drop all those people off, that's right. The devil always tries to give you an alternative. You know, God's put on this earth, like I was saying in the garden, he's put all these things in the earth, you know, like my sister stole an avocado seed from my house and now she is growing an avocado tree no she's giving it to me so 
it will come back. But God has put the ability to recreate amazing things out of what he's put on the earth for us. All we need to do is like water it, you know, focus on it, and it will grow and produce fruit. Whereas the devil provides these sugary alternatives like avocado dip filled with sodium, potassium and whatever it is, that they might be good things. But he, you know, it's like, oh, have an avocado dip when you could have an avocado and then take the seed and produce another one and then take the seed and produce another one and, ta- and be like this fruitful person. Or I said in the morning service and Justin told me not to say this, but Justin looks at pineapple lumps and goes, oh, this is so healthy. It's, a pi- it's related to a pineapple, you know, but a pineapple lump... I'm sure has no actual pineapple in it and it is not healthy it is just going to make you feel afraid to look in the mirror it's going to make you hide it's going to make you self-conscious and aware of your bareness but really a pineapple I'm sure it is good for things I'm sure there are many reasons why you should have a pineapple and you know it is it's really refreshing especially if you're in Queensland you do you know what when I was in Victoria I was on my oval at school and I had an apple and I got the core and I thought, I wonder if I plant this seed, like this core, I must have heard something. So I dug a hole in the middle of the school oval, literally in the middle, because I thought this would be entertaining during rugby season. So I dug a hole, planted the seed, watered it and covered it and then moved to Queensland. Didn't think about it for years. Then like 15 years later, I was preaching at youth one day and I thought, I'm going to go on Google Maps and see if my tree ever grew. Lo and behold, there is a flipping tree in the middle of the school oval. I should have prepared it to show you, but if you Google Valley Christian Community School in Morwell, Victoria, you will see a tree in the middle. I couldn't believe it, you know, like God just watered it, you know, a few weeks for 15 years. And it just grew because that's what, that's what the water, the river of God, it produces fruit, it bursts forth, it disperses over, it's not discriminatory about what you look like or who you are. It will just produce fruit if you just, you know, plant things and let God do with it what he wants. You know, you don't need to be focused on, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. When you just give things to God, it produces fruit and does amazing things in your life. So don't get distracted by these sugary alternatives, you know. People saying, oh, look on this, look on this app for a girl or I don't know, whatever. Look at, this drug will make you feel good and God's over here going, I'll make you feel good. Like, just focus on me. I've got everything. That's just a sugary alternative. Like, if you want to be off your head, I'll make you off your head, but in a good way where you don't (laughs) lose your brain cells but you can actually come out of it with wisdom instead of, like, brain damage. (laughs) So, focus on the Lord is what I'm trying to say. Don't focus on things you, that God's saying, don't focus on this because it would lead to disaster. And you're like, but I want wisdom. I want to make my own decisions. So, I'm going to focus on these girls or this drug or this this negative situation or this past event that someone did this to me and I'm not letting it go. I'm going to talk about it to every single person that I meet for the rest of my life. When you meet me, the first thing I'm going to say is that person left me, okay? Deal with it because I've got a chip on my shoulder. No, that is only going to slow you down. You're going to be running like a elephant when you could be free and finishing the race and doing everything God's called you to do. Isaiah 50 verse 7, this is Jesus talking. He is always our example, isn't that right? He's always our example. When you're thinking, oh, well, Jesus didn't have to deal with this or this or this or this. I tell you what, he dealt with a lot of annoying people. And in Isaiah 50 verse 7, it says, I offered my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who tore out my beard. I did not hide my face from scorn and spittle because the Lord God helps me. I have not been disgraced, therefore I have set my face like flint and I know that I will not be put to shame. So even though he could have been fixated on that person spat on me, that person pulled out my beard, that person didn't look at me at church, they actually threw a stone at me. You know, 
he had all those things. When he was just trying to save us, he had people doing that stuff to him and he said, I am not going to be worried about that stuff. I've got my face like flint and the joy set before me that I will have a relationship with these people one day, that I am going to endure the cross because I know I won't be disgraced when I go and do what God's asked me to do. He will vin- like vindicate me. He will accomplish what he wanted to accomplish and I don't need to worry about it. There is joy at the end. You know, what you are fixated on now is what you will end up at in the future. You know, the Bible talks about how your mouth is a rudder that causes a large ship to go in a certain direction or it causes a fire to, you know, your mouth and your tongue is like a little spark that can cause a whole fire to start. What you think about, what you dwell on, what you talk about is the direction that you will go. A few years ago, we had a boat and we were on the boat and Justin's driving the boat and thinking, isn't this beautiful? Look how cute my kids are. He gets his camera out to take a photo of the kids and drives into a sandbank. (laughs) Nearly killed us all, but he had a nice photo, you know. If you don't focus on what you're meant to be focused on, I mean, and they, she's a cute kid, but he just wasn't meant to be taking a photo of her while he was driving a boat. You just can't afford to not focus on what God's telling you to focus on. You can't afford to be like driving down the road on Facebook taking selfies when you're meant to be like looking. People give you rules for a reason, you know, like God's saying, don't look at that stuff, let it go so you can go ahead and you're like, No, but I need to focus on it because if I don't focus on it, no one will feel bad for me. You know, who cares? Focus on what's ahead so you don't have a crash of your whole life because you're looking at the wrong thing. Fixate on what's important, your family, God, and your purpose. That's what this year's been about, focusing back on what's important. Adam and Eve could have been focused on what God had just provided for them, their whole future ahead. Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Seek, search, require, demand, getting to the bottom of the matter, the kingdom of God. You know, I broke down the word, took a long time to do this, but I split it down the middle and it says, fix eight. What you're fixed on, you will eat, you will consume. The Bible talks about you will eat the fruit of your lips. So what comes out of your lips you will come back as a fruit, you know, that you will keep, it will keep going in and out, in and out, in and out. If you, that's in Proverbs 13 too, if you are so focused on something, you will eat the fruit of that. If you're focused on like negativity, you will keep eating negativity. If you're focused on God and speaking life, you will eat life and blessing into your body. Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, I've made you an acronym so that you can remember to think about those things, okay? It's called the pre-leap. If you want to not be stuck and move forward this is the precursor to leaping forward to being jolted forward are you ready it's just from that scripture so you can guess them pretty easily you got to think about what's true what's true means what can't be hidden adam and eve thought about what god told them not to think about and they had to hide it You know, if you, Pastor Dave used to always say, if you can't do it in the church foyer, you probably shouldn't be doing it. If you're thinking about something that you've got to hide from people or hide from God, then I'm telling you, you shouldn't be thinking about it, right? The next one is, what is honourable? Honourable means to be in awe of, to be honest. Don't think about questionable things. Don't think about, if someone's told you something that's not true over your life, if someone's told you, you are 
disgusting or you will never amount to anything. Is that true? Is that honorable? Is that something that is honest from God? No, so don't think about it. The next one is excellent. Excellent means to have moral goodness. If it's something that's not morally good, don't think about it. We all know what that stuff is. Don't think about it. The next one is what is pure. Pure means to be perfect, to be clean. Don't think about impure things. The next one is right, which means righteousness, approved by God. If, you can, if you're thinking about something and you think, would God approve this? Then you probably shouldn't be thinking about it. Now, I tried to come up with a few acronyms. One was trap lane, which didn't really make sense. One was plain something, didn't make sense. So excuse me, I had to repeat the E three times. So to make sense, we are thinking about what's excellent again. Moral goodness, come on, what is morally good? Okay, next one, lovely. Lovely means to be pleasing, acceptable and grateful. Worth the effort to have and to embrace. If you're thinking about something or someone Are they worth the effort to have and embrace? Are they acceptable, pleasing? Will you be grateful long-term to have that person in your life? Is it worthy for what God's called? When God said, I've made someone that's, you know, going to be perfect for you, be fit together, perfect for you. And you're like, nah, but I want this drop kick because it's Mr. Right now. Do you think that's the person you should be thinking about? No. Think long-term, people. Think about something that's excellent. Come on, guys. Is it morally good or is this morally bad? Is this something that's really going to ruin your life? Well, stop thinking about it. Why would you want to think about it? This is your life. Why would you want to ruin your own life when God's telling you, I've got everything you need. I've got what you need for your future. I've got what needs to get rid of your past. I've called you with a purpose. I've counted, I listen to every cry. I'm close to the brokenhearted. But you're like, no, but I want to think about idiots. It's really not rocket science. Okay, admirable. That means what is praiseworthy and commendable. Think about it. If we got you up on the stage and we were like, oh, great, you took drugs again. Clap, 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 clap. It's not praiseworthy. So why are you thinking about it? You know, think about something that you would give praise for, something that you would, you know, yeah. God provided all my needs or I robbed someone. What's praiseworthy? Oh, that was the last one. The pre-leap. Before you're going to go anywhere, you need to be thinking about the right things. Your whole future depends on thinking about the right things and getting rid of the past. And it's so easy. You think about it. Like in the garden, they had this this river that was going to keep going and going and going. We've got that river of God. We've got the counsellor. We've got got the Holy Spirit that is always with us, interceding for us. We've got everything that we need. Just don't let things hold you down. Is the band here? Maybe not. Oh, no, they're coming. Yes, they're coming. I'm going to pray and the band is going to sing a song for us. And I want you just in this time to really let go of those things that hold you back. Let go of those things that weigh you down. Let go of those people that have just done that injustice to you that is not allowing you to be free and to run forward. So, Lord, I just pray for every single person here. I thank you, Father, that you know every single thing about their life. You know their past, their present, and their future. And you know, Lord, that your, um, your destiny and your calling over us is never, never irrevocable. You have called us all. It doesn't matter what mistakes we've made, what um, things we've done in the past. We thank you, Father, that you do not change the call of God over our life. 
And we just pray for a freedom this morning that people would not be bound in the shame and the fear and all the things that the devil's tried to hold us back with. But Lord, people would be free to run the race with endurance, to, to keep their eyes focused, not to focus on the left or the right, the tree that they shouldn't touch, but Lord, focus on the the beautiful garden that you have in front of us, the richness of everything that you've given us to live an amazing life and have amazing families and do amazing things for you, Lord. And I just thank you for your joy. Lord, I thank you that you are um, moving in this place today to bring freedom to every single person that's here in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.